My love of kites started about 20 years ago. I taught math for 35 years. I just combined the two to try to reach all of my students. I figured, why not take this whole math lesson outside? Maybe, just maybe, they would see the relationship. My name is Winfred Randolph Lowe, but in Delray on the beach when I'm flying my kites, they call me Randy the Kite Man. I started flying kites 20 years ago. I bought my first kite and I never looked back. I fly my kites as much as possible. I have about 60 or 70 kites. On any particular given day, you can paint the sky with sea creatures, whales, scuba divers. You're not only looking at the kite, but you're looking at the strings. There's math there, and you can do something with it. Kites are geometric figures, kites are triangles. And that is uh, one of the things that I tried to take advantage of. Instead of doing it in the classroom at desk, we take them out in the field. Pythagorean theorem is a formula used to determine sides of triangles. If we want to use the Pythagorean theorem on a beach as we're trying to fly a kite, and we let the kite go, and it travels up the line, better known as the hypotenuse. If we draw a line from the top of the kite down to the bottom, that's side A. If we draw another line from that point back to where we let the kite go, that would be side B. So by plugging those numbers into the triangle, we have just figured out how long our string is from where we are standing to the top of the kite. There's your answer. If we could do fractions, common denominators, uncommon denominators, the more complicated the numbers are, the more math there is. I retired six years ago. We get a lot of families that come on Delray Beach and they have kids and I teach math. I tell them, see that right there? We could do a math problem with that, you know? And some kids understand, oh yeah, we did that in school. Nowadays, they see it. But uh, for a lot of the younger kids, uh, get some thinking too. The ice is typically around five centimeters when I skate on it. That sound you hear is actually a combination of two sounds. It's the sounds from cracks striking beneath me and the vibrations within the ice plate itself. It sounds like it's something supersonic. Meet Morten Einer. Hi, I'm Morten Einer. He's a mathematician who enjoys riskier hobbies than most. I've been skating on thin ice for 40 years. When he's skating though, he's also listening. The thinner the ice, the higher the pitch. Just about when the ice is to break, and that would be about three centimeters, the pitch is at the high C, the supposedly highest note of the soprano C. Morton relies on his knowledge as a mathematician to calculate the thickness of the ice, its flexibility, and its temperature. Many people tend to freak out when they see us skating on thin ice, but I couldn't be more calm because I know what I'm doing. Sometimes the ice is perfectly clear and I can see fish below, even a beaver, and also free divers swimming under the ice. When Morton first started, there wasn't any physics or scientific information to explain how thin ice skating is possible. He studied the ice for 10 years every winter to explain the phenomenon. I observed three things with a thin ice. One is that the ice bends, and the thinner it is, the more it bends. The ice needs to be flexible to support you. Second, the first crack is a true warning signal. Then I know the ice is thin, and when it gets even thinner, more cracks evolve. And finally, the ice gives sonorous tone, beautiful, eerie tone, which immediately tells me how thick the ice is. It's called the coincidence frequency, and it can be calculated mathematically. Morton has skated on over 1,800 bodies of water in North America, Norway, and Central and Eastern Europe. I love skating for the excitement and challenges it brings. 
It's an opportunity for math and nature to come together and make it understandable for me. I've been skating most of my life and I always look forward to next winter. We're gonna go ahead and get situated. This is the finance program, and we always like to see new faces. When you come to Wall Street's financial literacy class, you're gonna see people with tattoos and dreads and, and just people you normally wouldn't expect to see learning finance. You're gonna see people of all different backgrounds looking for hope. He makes it universal. If I tell you, I'll give you the 50 bucks, but I want you to pay me back $50 in interest, what you gonna say? Say no. You gonna say what? No. And why you gonna say no? They call me Wall Street because I teach all of the financial classes here at San Quentin. Um, and I've been teaching uh, financial education for about 10 years now. I am in prison for participating in a robbery murder. And um, I was sentenced to 54 years of life in prison uh, for that crime and I've been incarcerated now for 22 years. These are the stocks that I picked. MasterCard, I got an 89, they're at 200. Wall Street came to prison illiterate. He doesn't have a college education to this day. He only has a GED. And yet this guy is successfully trading from prison. My celly, who had come from Juvenile Hall with me, he would read the sports page to me. He'd be like, man, go get it and I'll read it. I grabbed the paper and I was like, I got it. And when I turned around, an order guy said, hey man, you play the stock market. And I realized that I picked up the business section instead of the sports page. I was like, ah, oh, man. And I asked him what the stock market was, and he told me, he said, that's the place where white folks keep all their money. And, and that's when I really first discovered the stock market. So I started teaching myself how to read. Family, or friends on the outside, opened up online brokers accounts. And I basically told them what to buy and when to buy and when to sell. And, and I mean, that was just simply, was, it was really just that easy. This is a finance program, but I don't teach about finance. I teach financial, empowerment, emotional literacy. That's what I teach. So I think financial education is important for incarcerated people, given that the crimes that are committed are financially motivated and driven. When I learned about financial education myself, um, I thought that would be something that other men in my same situation could benefit from. And so now the program teaches incarcerated men how to better manage their emotions and relations to their financial standing. So you gotta weigh your strategies when you're talking about giving yourself room to start saving money. When you're traumatized, you do a lot of things you don't know why you're doing them. And that happens with finance too. I suffered a lot of trauma in my life, and my trauma like culminated in me uh, murdering a man. So while this is very important to me, to, because I do need to uh, manage my money and manage my life, what's most important is that I'm managing my emotional responsibilities, because the last time I didn't do that, a man lost his life. I don't think you can have full rehabilitation without financial education. I can make amends for the crimes that I've done, I can even stop doing the things that I've done. But I think for people who were criminals, when you empower those people and they know that they don't have to commit crime like I did, when I learned that I didn't have to commit crime, it was like, wow, like I can really make something in my life and I don't have to be a criminal. The legend around this chalk is that it's impossible to write a false theorem. I assume the special ingredient was angel tears. Mathematicians from all the top schools very frequently use it. It's a cult favorite. As soon as I used it, I was a convert. The chalk is one of the best kept secrets in the math world. It's the Rolls Royce of chalk.
Hagoromo is a brand of Japanese chalk. The way it flows on a board is a bit hard to describe in words. It's really hard to get. You can only get it from Japan. You need a Japanese person to bring it back for you. I discovered it when I went to visit the University of Tokyo, and one of the professors there said to me, you know, we have better chalk than you do in the States. And I said, oh, go on, chalk is chalk. And so I tried it out, and I was surprised to find that he was right. I tried it, and I thought it was phenomenal. It's the densest, it erases the cleanest, it leaves the nicest light. If you use bad chalk, often you have to press really hard for anyone to see what you're writing. So using Hagarama on a good board, it doesn't really feel like you're working hard to write. When I'm teaching, I get a feeling of energy, confidence, and the chalk absolutely helps. Slowly the math world has become aware of this, and it became a bit of a, a fad in some circles. It was like maybe four years ago, the word came out that the company was going out of business. I sort of jokingly referred to it as a chalk apocalypse, so I immediately started hoarding up as much as I could. I ordered three boxes of Hagaramo and kept it in my office and used it very sparingly. I should have bought more, but I have friends that bought boxes and boxes and boxes of the stuff. They might very well be set for the rest of their career. We got like 1,500 sticks. That's a lot of days, four sticks a day. I think I'm gonna make it. I have probably a 10-year supply still at home. I calculated how many boxes would I need to last for 10 or 15 years. I didn't want to become a chalk dealer, but I did like the idea that I could be the first stick is free chalk dealer on the block in my department. I was probably selling it regularly to maybe eight to 10 colleagues. I would reach into my cupboard in my office and pull out another box and we'd do the deal in my office. And we all had a chalk fix and we still do. The original Hagaroma chalk is slowly disappearing. A few years ago, uh, a Korean company bought their formulas and did the best job of faithfully reproducing it in Korea. It was mixed emotions. I was happy to know that it would still be made, but I was a little disappointed that I was less clever than I thought I was. In many ways, mathematics is like craftsmanship. In some ways it's like artistry, in some ways it's like science but there's a real high craft side to giving a beautiful lecture on a blackboard. Mathematicians admire this in each other and like to use the best tools for it. There's incredible value to this, but the value is in using it up, not hoarding it.